I'm telling you, I need something. We're good? Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Amen. You all have a good week last week? Yeah. Yes, that is good. That is good. Okay, well, we're going to do, first song we're going to do, I have not sang in a while, so if I mess up, I apologize. That's all I want to stand, turn to page 165. 165. One sixty five. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion and splendor. Sixty-two. We all know this one. One sixty-two. To God be the glory, great things He hath done, and be the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atoned. Oh, 
seated. Well, howdy, good morning. How's everybody today? A nice cooler weather. We missed the rain, but I'm sure the Lord will send us some soon. Amen. I have a little short letter here from the Dobbins, Mike and Letitia Dobbins in Zambia, and it's rather short, so I'm going to read the whole thing. I just read it last night, and I said, man, that's so good, I've got to read the whole thing. So, Mike and Letitia Dobbins, missionaries to Zambia, and hello out there in cell phone land. In the last few days, I've read many newsletters of missionaries who are still locked down in their homes for no reason. It has been a brief, a grief, excuse me, it has been grief to hear of that. We are so thankful that Zambia never did a lockdown, and we have been free to carry on and do the ministry as we have always done in the past. Praise the Lord, a British missionary returned recently here to Zambia, and we chatted. I told him that we only were focused, excuse me, I can't read this morning. I told him that we only had were forced to close down church for two weeks. He said, but you were supposed to close down. I said, well, not in the Bible. When you read the book of Acts, they continued to assemble even if it meant being killed. He looked at me as if this thought had never yet entered his mind and said, it's true. With some perplexity, we live in a time when saved people don't read the Bible, and when they do, they do not consider things like not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together to be a command. The lack of discernment and courage amongst church leaders nowadays is real, is the real pandemic. The Lord gave me five souls this month in personal work. I'm going to try to pronounce these right. Reagan Chota, Howard Masikela, Richard Mumba, Limpo Molanda, and Gift Kalasha. <laughs> the amazing thing is that Howard, Limpo, and Gift are all Jehovah's Witnesses. The JWs are still not meeting due to the insanely cautious response to COVID-19. Most churches in Zambia started meeting again in May, but not the JWs. It is hurting them too. Their people are tired of it and losing their ability to refuse our literature and witness. Not meeting regularly has caused them to lose that hardness to say, no, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Consequently, they're sitting down with us, hearing the gospel and getting saved. Amen. amen. <laughs> that was the next word. Amen. <laughs> amen from everybody on that. Our other soul winners are also reaching them. This goes to show you that their method of doing live stream on Zoom is not to be followed. It will weaken your flock, and soon they will be easy prey. We had a membership class at the Mind Church, and seven people attended. It is good to see the church continues to grow. We pray that they keep growing, going forward. The Chiwampela Church really needs prayer, as we have a great need for someone in that church to have a vision for lost souls. Pray the Lord of the harvest to raise up some laborers. Amen. I thought that's outstanding. So hopefully that touched your heart. So we need to pray for them, pray for the church at Chilwimpella and uh, for their growth, for the, for the Dobbins family and all those in Zimbabwe. Can you say it? Zambia. It's the wrong one. That was last week. <laughs> pray for souls to be saved and growth in those churches. Protection and guidance for the Dobbins and all the missionaries, and all those serving in our local missionary and public outreach here locally and for growth. So let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Dobbins and we ask that you bless them and protect them and put your Holy Spirit hand of protection upon them and their church for growth, for the church in Chihuahua and all the churches over there and the saints there that you would grow them and help us to have courage and strength and fortitude to, to stand for what you want us to, Lord, even at the, at the risk of being, you know, being uh, made a fool of or being laughed at or whatever, Lord. Help us to, to stand for, for you no matter what. We pray for protection and guidance in our local missionaries, those serving in public outreach around here in Kennedy, that you get souls saved, that you continue encouraging Christians to be more vocal by this outreach, and uh, that you protect and guide us all. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we ask it. Amen. Brother Brian. All right, announcements. Uh, there you go. <laughs> All right, announcements. Um, public ministry this week, Kennedy, Thursday, 1030, and Friday, 430 in Kennedy. And then we got a neat announcement this week. Uh, my, my heart was full this week. Um, the nursing home, not the one we used to go to, but Hacienda Oaks, I called this week. And they were so excited to have somebody offer to do services. They were so excited. And so next week, we're going to start doing nursing home ministry. And it's probably going to be every Sunday at 2 o'clock. And uh, there will be some precautions. We've got to take precautions. We're going to do it outside, looks like. That way, if you're a volunteer, you don't have to get COVID tested. So uh, we'll do it outside. And this was something they set up. They, they were, um, the lady there, Brenda, she was very nice. And she, she said, at first she said, no, we can't do anything. We're not doing anything. But then she said, but let me, let me see what I can do. And uh, she arranged it so we can have, we'll have services outside. We won't have to go through testing or anything like that. Probably have to wear masks. Um, but there will be some stipulations on it. But it is an encouragement to, to have some doors open that I thought would never, I thought we'd never be able to go back into a nursing home or anything like that. And so that's going to start next Sunday, 2 o'clock. And we will probably, depending on when we started it earlier this year, we had so many volunteers. <laughs> it, was, it was a blessing. And we had a lot of fun, too. And... Uh, but we probably will have to limit or rotate folks out if we have that many volunteers just to accommodate the rules and things like that. But just the, just the fact that it's opening up again, just the fact that they've allowed us to do this, well, it's, that's a blessing. So nursing home ministry will start, looks like next Sunday. I'll have more details next Sunday, but it looks like it'll start 2 o'clock next Sunday and run. We, we have the opportunity to do it every single Sunday. So uh, that, is, that is a blessing. I, I will say my, uh, you know, the, the Bible says it talks about love others as yourself, things like that. Uh, I, my, I have a selfish motive because I think if I was ever in a nursing home, which one day maybe be, that, be there, I would love for folks to come and have a service. I would love it. And so I know it was a blessing when we were doing it over at Woodridge and uh, now Arden Place, but uh, Hacienda Oaks has opened up, and they're going to let us come in and do services every Sunday. So that's a blessing. Um, another thing that's happening, I'll just give you a notice of it. It's a little ways away, but we're going to have a special evangelistic Christmas um, service, and Children's Church is going to be a big part of that. Um, so... If you, you would like your kids involved in it, the first two Sundays of December, they need to be in children's church because those are the practice days. So the first two Sundays of December for children's church, uh, if you're interested in uh, your children participating, they need to be here for those Sundays. But I, I want you to be thinking about it, be praying about it. We'll have a big evangelistic uh, a service. We'll have one service that day right before Christmas on Sunday, 
and uh, it'll just be we'll have a the kids do the children's church the program and then we'll preach a, just evangelistic service so that's coming up a little ways off but uh, it'll be here before before we all know it and then lastly i noticed uh some, some of y'all most of y'all didn't pick these the papers up but the october financials are on the front front row here there's some uh, uh budget or um, p ls they're printed off for you if you're interested if you'd like to see it so the october numbers are there so you can see and i'll just say the lord has taken care of us immensely so uh, it's a blessing and it's a blessing like i said last week we may need to start thinking about uh projects for missionaries or taking on more missionaries um that's that's how uh, the lord's blessed the last this last year so those are the announcements uh let's see i guess let's have a couple men come forward and we will take up the offering this morning Craig, how about you pray for us? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to worship you. Lord, we tell you we love you and just thank you for all you've done for us. And Lord, what encouragement to hear the missionary updates every Sunday, Lord, and that, Man. that uh, Brother Allen's already said that he would uh, put a head of protection around these missionaries and bless them and guide them and direct them, Lord, and give them fruit, Lord. Uh, encourage them in the field as they're, uh, uh, they already have enough uh, things to deal with, but with this uh, COVID stuff going on, it just makes it that much harder for them, Lord. And pray you guide them and direct them and bless them. Thank you for the blessings that you bestowed upon us here and, and, and the uh, strength of, uh, of the ministries and the things that are going on, Lord, and your blessings upon them, and not only us financially, but the other uh, other things that our uh, Bible Baptist Church is doing, Lord. Amen. Pray you uh, bless us this morning. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you as their Savior, God, they would hear something this morning that touch their hearts, Lord, and they would accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, and they could spend eternity in heaven with you and avoid eternity in hell. God, uh, guide us and direct us and bless us in all these things. Give the honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First Samuel chapter 12, talk about renewal this morning, renewal, it's a good, uh, good positive subject, renewing the kingdom, first Samuel chapter 12, Samuel has said in 1 first, in first Samuel chapter 11, the chapter before this, uh, he, he says to Saul and the Israelites, let's go to Gilgal, we'll renew the kingdom there after the victory over the Ammonites. And uh, so this is, 1 Samuel 12, is the sermon that Samuel preaches to renew the kingdom at Gilgal. And it's, it's not to... Not to uplift Saul. Um, when Samuel says this, he, he's not trying to, he's, he's not going to highlight Saul's victory. Uh, he's not going to highlight the great leadership of Saul. Uh, he's, he's not going to laud Saul or, or lift Saul up um, in renewing the kingdom. In fact, he's, gonna, he's going to lift up the Lord and show how the Lord had accomplished what he wanted to accomplish through Saul and uh, 
this this will be unfortunately the 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 last time this this happens. But uh, Samuel preaches this sermon, and I, I can't stress enough because it, it affects how you interpret and understand the rest of the Old Testament. But I can't stress enough the fact that God did not intend to put a throne in Israel at this time. His intention with Israel was to put Jesus Christ on the throne when it was time to put Jesus Christ on the throne. But Israel demanded a king, and God gave it to him, gave, gave him a king, Saul, with the caveat that I'm going to give you a king and I'm going to put a throne in your nation, and once you have that throne, I'm not going to take the throne away. Eventually, you'll have people on the throne that you don't want to have on the throne. But uh, you you have essentially, by your demands, you have created a situation where you've you've hindered yourself. You've kind of hobbled yourself. But the Lord's going to work with them anyway because there is people and his name is is amidst Israel and uh, on the nation of Israel. So 1 Samuel chapter 12 We'll just read the first five verses just to, just to get started here. And I'll tell you the main point of this is going to come at the end. Samuel's going to give, a, give some information at the beginning. He's going to set the whole thing up. And then at the end, he's going to give them five things about renewal that you can either you can take it or leave it. Um, essentially, Israel, he lays it out, lays out the plan, lays out the opportunities in spite of the the obstacles he lays out the opportunities um, and they're they're instructive for for even us but let's start off first Samuel chapter 12 verse 1 the Bible says and Samuel said unto all Israel behold I have hearkened unto your voice and all that ye said unto me and have made a king over you and now behold the king walketh before you and I am old and gray headed and behold my sons are with you and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold here I am witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken or whose ass have I taken or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He's witness. All right, we'll stop there. And I'm going to give you the, the layout of this whole sermon. But the, the theme of this is, it should be hopeful. It should be hopeful because it's about renewing the kingdom. And this is what Samuel says, let's go to Gilgal and let's renew the kingdom there. And then he's going to preach this message. And the first thing he says is he provides opportunity for Israel to, to make a claim against him. Have I done something wrong to you to, to, to cloud my judgment in what I'm about to tell you? Have I, have I, have I, have I taken bribes? Have I stolen from you? What, somebody, if, if you haven't accusation to make make it now and I will I will make it right and so Samuel lays out lays out the the opportunity there at the beginning and the people say you you have treated us right you've done right by us you haven't taken bribes you haven't clout your judgment isn't clouded you are you are a an, an unbiased messenger and we understand that and so the first, the first thought in this, the first five verses, is here's an unbiased messenger that all of Israel recognizes as an unbiased messenger. So what Samuel's about to say doesn't have any, he doesn't have any particular motivation or he doesn't have any particular dog in the fight. He's just going to say what the Lord has told him to say. And the people have recognized before all the nation, the people have recognized this guy is he Samuel is, a, is a, an unbiased man. He he has not perverted judgment in any way. He has taught taught us the words of God, and so uh, Samuel is blameless, and therefore he is he is objective in his judgment of the nation's predicament. So this is important because when Samuel explains the nation's predicament, 
He, he's not coming from any angle. He's not trying to angle. He's not trying to, so trying to work his way into power or, or work his way into some money or, or whatever. He, he, he is just simply there to tell the folks exactly what God's told him. Second thing is, so you see the unbiased messenger. Second thing is, in verses 6 through 15, Samuel's going to explain the unalterable mess. Now, if you didn't catch it, all these, all these little topics are, are U and M. An unbiased messenger, an unalterable mess. So just so you can follow along, it makes it easier. An unalterable mess. So here's what Samuel says. Here's your position. Is really, this is the predicament you're now in. Verse 6. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. So that there was no king there. And he highlights, the Lord did this. And he didn't need a king to do it. Verse 7, now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. I love that, that word, reason. Let's, let's reason. Come, let us reason together. You'll, you'll find that faith is a reasonable, it is a reasonable um, uh, 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 expedition. I mean, it, it is a reasonable idea. It's a reasonable thought. It's a, re- it's a reasonable practice. Faith is reasonable. So Samuel says, I'm not going to give you any outlandish arguments. Let me just reason with you about what God's done. Verse 8. When Jacob was come into Egypt and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord, the Lord, highlight that, sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt. And made them dwell in this, this place. And when they forgot the Lord, their God, he sold them into the, the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balaam and Ashtoreth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And the Lord sent Jer- Jerobel, that's Gideon, by the way, and Beden and Jephthah and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelled safe. So Samuel is just, he's just highlighting, this is, what you, this is what you asked for from the Lord. This is what the Lord sent. He sent you some men. They delivered you, and then you rejected the Lord, and then he sent some enemies in, and they oppressed you, and then you cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent deliverers in, and he delivered you, and you just went back and forth like this. But the whole point is, the Lord was, was, was the center of the whole thing. If you, if you obeyed the Lord, then the enemies wouldn't come in, and if you, if you disobeyed the Lord, the enemies came in, and when you cried out to the Lord, he sent uh, 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 help for you, and he did all this with, without you ever having a king. He didn't, he didn't need to put a throne in Israel to do this. You, you had a relationship with the Lord, and you didn't need a throne to do this. Then he says in verse uh, 12, and when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us. When the, watch this. When the Lord your God was your king. See, that, that's important. Nay, but a king shall reign over us is what they said. When the Lord your God was your king. So the the king of Israel was guiding Israel, shepherding Israel from heaven. He just just wasn't on a throne on the earth yet. He was in heaven shepherding a nation and the nation cried out to the Lord and got help and then disobeyed the Lord and got hurt and, and things like that. And Samuel just says, all of this happened and you didn't, you didn't have a king because you already had a king in heaven. But then the Ammonites showed up and then you said, give us a king right now. 
And the Lord protested that, and he said, no, you, you don't want a king right now. You, your nation is not ready for a throne. Your nation is not, you're not, you're not ready for this. I'm not ready for you to have a throne in Israel. Nevertheless, the people said, no, we want a throne in Israel now. And the Lord said, okay, I'll give you a throne in Israel. So he did. And he gives them Saul. And up until this point, they didn't need a king. But now, now they've got one. Verse 13. Now, therefore, behold the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against his commandment of the, the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. So the Lord just simply says through Samuel, you demanded a king, now you have a king. Now the instruction is still the same. You, you serve God. Or you disobey God and God's still going to continue to treat you the way he had always treated you in history. Now this is, this is unique in Israel. This isn't about the United States or anything like that. It's about Israel's history. And so he says, and if you choose to disobey, I'll, I'll just take out you and your king. But I don't need your king. You already had a king. I'm your king. And you demanded me to put a, a throne in Israel. So I did it. And the, 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 uh, uh, the instruction hasn't changed. Either, either serve the Lord, follow the Lord, or don't serve him and don't obey his voice. And, and things won't go very well for you. Then, it's, it's, this is kind of a, a, like Elijah type uh, scenario here. After Samuel gives and rehearses all of this in his sermon... He calls the weather to witness what he's just said. And he says this. He, sa- he says, if the, if the Lord is, is going to testify of this, let, let some rain have him. Let some thunder clouds form around here. And so watch what he says. Now, therefore, verse 16. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. God, again, the Lord never intended him to have a king. Not, not at this time. David's going to be a good king. Yeah, that, that's right. David will be a good king. But the Lord never intended them to have a king yet. So Samuel calls the thunder and the rain to testify the Lord to send thunder and rain. And in verse 18, so Samuel called unto the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. That sounds like, I don't know if you ever have ever read that, but maybe you thought Elijah was the only one that called down rain, but Samuel did it too. In fact, Samuel did it before Elijah did it. And all the people said, verse 19, Samuel, unto Samuel, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. You know what Israel realizes at this point? God God has testified. Samuel's laid out the history. He calls the weather to testify. He calls the Lord to send thunder and rain. It thunders and rains all day. And the people fear, and they know they are, they are not right with God. They have demanded of God something that he didn't want to do, but he, he compromised with them. And he gave them a king. And he says, look, you have now, you have now hurt your nation. You've hurt your nation. And, I, and I'm not removing the, the pain that you're going to cause to your kids and your grandkids. I'm not going to remove that pain. Nevertheless, if you will follow me, this is an opportunity now to renew the kingdom. 
Not renew Saul as a king, not renew and, and, and praise Saul for his great leadership, but it, it's as an opportunity to get your eyes off of man and get your eyes back on the Lord. To quit looking at people around you and start looking at God again. So Samuel calls the thunder and lightning and rain and the Lord sends all that and the people say, we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. And now Samuel's going to address it. He will say, all right, now you understand your position. And you have to understand your position before I can give you some help in this. You've got to understand where you're at with the Lord here. And, I, and you understand, I mean, that's, that's, that's true of any individual. You've got to understand where you're at with the Lord. That's why he tells you in the Bible where you're at with him. That's why he points out sin. That's why he points out uh, things you don't like him to point out and I don't like him to point out. But you, you have to know where you stand with God before you're going to get your relationship fixed. So here's what Samuel lays out. Here's the underlying mandate in, the, in this thing. There's five things about renewing the kingdom. They understand their position now. They understand they have put things in motion and begged God and demanded of God to put things in motion and that are not going to be good for him. So here's what Samuel says. <clears throat> to renew the kingdom, here's, here's the advice. Number one, renew, renew your life by staying the course. Verse 20, it says this. And Samuel said unto the Lord, fear, or said unto the people, Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet... Turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. The first thing he says is, let's, let's reset here. Let's reset. Let's get back to the history of our nation. Let's get back to the beginning where we followed the Lord. Get back to, back to the beginning of this thing. And he says, look, you, you, have, you, you, have, you have done irreparable harm to your nation. Nevertheless, if you will follow the Lord and not turn aside to vain things and follow the Lord, he will help you. He will help you through this. So the first thing about renewing the nation and renewing your life is stay the course. I, I, I say that and, and mention that um, most of us and pr mo many of us, maybe most of us, could say in, in my life, I have picked up some bad habits that hinder my relationship with God. I, I have lived life and I have picked up things along the way that, that don't help. They don't help my relationship with the Lord. They hinder my relationship with the Lord. You know what Israel's looking at? A decision that they've picked up that is going to hinder their relationship with God. And Samuel says, look, yeah, you're going to live with this thing. You're going to live with this throne in the midst of your nation. Nevertheless, don't turn aside either way to vain things, but let's reset. Let's get back on course and let's stay the course now. Let's get back to, back to what, what brought us to the Lord. I, I think about um, uh, when a per person gets saved, or when I got saved, it, it just, just as, a, as a testimony. I got saved, I, I, I trusted Jesus Christ, and I, w I was so excited, I was so excited. I wanted to tell everybody in my neighborhood, and so I would, I, would, <laughs> I, I, I was 10 years old, and I'm just, Trying to, trying to trick other 10-year-olds that, that I go to school with into conversations about the gospel just so we can talk about Jesus. And I was just so excited about it. And then after 10 years old, then I became a teenager. And all of that excitement sort of went out the window, not because I was a teenager, but because as a teenager, I pick up things that aren't conducive to my relationship with the Lord. I start picking things up along my life and thinking, okay, you know, the, before you know it, you're not even, you're not even 
Uh, or I'm not even, I, I'm more consumed with all this other stuff that I've picked up along the way. That's Israel's predicament. And what Samuel says is, it's time for a reset now. All the stuff you picked up, let, let's go back before all that. Let's go back before you picked up all these bad habits. And let's remember how, how you got where you are. Let's remember how, how, how you first came to know Jesus Christ. I know that's not, this isn't the gospel presentation or anything like that, but it really uh, it, 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 uh, it coincides with, with that. Um, don't turn them aside to vain things. That's what he tells Israel. We, 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 all, we could look at our lives and look at how many bad habits we've picked up in life. But remember, this is a renewing of the kingdom that Samuel's talking about. It's not a hopeless situation. It's a reset is what it is. Samuel lays out the history so that Israel will remember. You need to remember where you came from. You need to remember where you came from. When Maybe if you're saved, you need to remember what you got saved out of. Maybe that will maybe keep you from running back into it. You need to remember where, where God saved you, where he found you, where you were found when you got saved, if you're saved. If you're not saved, I'd encourage you. Jesus Christ is the only salvation. He's the only foundation. He died for your sins. He rose, rose again, and he offers you freely eternal life. He offers you freely righteousness because you can't earn righteousness. You can't create righteousness. You, you, can't, you can't muster up a, a, good, a good enough deed that will get you out of a grave. This body, is, it, it, will, it will one day be in a grave. It will die. It, it's on that course. And there's no good deed. There, 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 you can't muster enough willpower to get yourself out of a grave one day. But Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And he offers freely eternal life. You need to remember that. Remember that. Renew your life by staying the course. Don't follow vanity. There, there's no profit in things that don't save. Second thing he says is this. Renew your life by defending what God defends. Verse 22. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. So what Samuel just said is, God created the nation of Israel out of nothing. And he put his name on that nation. And he's not going to abandon the nation. I, I, would, I, would, I would love to be... <laughs> don't mistake this for the United States of America. I, I, I agree. We were founded on some biblical principles. But God's name is on the nation of Israel. And God said, I am not forsaking you because my name is on your nation. What, 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 what a blessing to have that kind of promise. Where you could just call out to God and say, Lord, we are your people. Help. We are your people. For your name's sake, help us. But you know what? As an individual, you have that in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ says, look, what, whatsoever you ask in my name, I'll do it. I mean, it's, and it's, it, it is, a, it is, a, it is a, an opportunity. It is a, 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 a privilege that God would do something, not because you're good enough or I'm good enough or we impress God so much, but because Jesus Christ impressed God so much. You come to the Father on Jesus Christ's behalf and in his name and say, and I, I know I've said it before, but... In Jesus' name, is not, it's not an incantation or a magic spell. It's literally how I get to the throne of grace. In Jesus' name. That's the only way I get there. So Samuel reminds the nation of Israel, God's not going to forsake this nation. But you may be lost in the mix as an individual. But God's not going to forsake the nation. Here's how you, here's how you renew that's how you renew your life, by defending what God defends. Take up, take up the, the cause that God's taken up. I, I, I love seeing the opportunities lately in church. I mean, just the opportunities to get the gospel out and folks responding. Some mostly good responses, some, some negative responses, but mostly good responses. 
but just the opportunities. I mean, everything else seems to be shut down, and, and or it seems like it's, I don't know, it's just, it's just a wonky kind of time, but uh, it, there, there's opportunities when you take up the cause that God's taken up. The Lord is, is about, he, he said, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He, came, he wants to edify a body. He wants to edify his, his church. And when you take up that cause, you, you are sure to have his support in that. You know what David's going to do in the next couple chapters? The Lord's going to say in the next chapter, and, and we'll deal with why he says this, but he's going to say, I'm done with Saul. I'm done with Saul. I'm looking for a new king now. I'm going to find somebody after my heart. You guys want a throne? I gave you a throne. You, you picked the leader. I put the leader on the throne. He's no good. Now I'm going to find somebody after my heart, and I'm going to put him on that throne. That's David. And David, when you find David the first time, David has taken up the cause of God in the Philistines, in, in, in the famous battle against Goliath. He goes out there. And he says, who, who, who is this giant? Who is this guy that thinks he defies the, the armies of the living God? Who is this guy? And all the, all the Israelites are kind of timid and they're like, well, don't, you know, don't say that so loud, David. I said, You're going to make this guy mad. And David's like, well, God's mad at you for being afraid of this guy. This guy defies God Almighty. Is anyone going to take up God's cause and do something about this? And so David will go out there with his five smooth stones and one for the giant and one for his four brothers. And he kills Goliath, chops off his head, and he says, is there not a cause? I mean, what are we doing here? Can we take up God's cause? I mean, guarantee you take up God's cause. You have God's support if you take up his cause. He's already said, this is where I'm working and if you'll work in the field I'm working in, you will have my blessing in that. Renew your life by defending what God defends. Lord, help us, help us for your name's sake. Help us so Jesus Christ gets glory. That, that, that's my prayer. I, I just want our, our church to, to, I want Jesus Christ to get as much glory out of this church as he possibly can. I, I, I don't want us to, to stifle that in any way, but I know, I know we do. I know I do. But I want Jesus Christ to be magnified out of this church as much as he possibly can. That's the cause of God. That, that, is, that is taking up, taking up and defending what God defends. Third thing is this. You need to renew your life by personal commitment to prayer and sound doctrine. Look what Samuel says in verse 23. He says, moreover, as for me, here's your position, here's what I'm going to do. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. You know, you know why Samuel says that? For, let me try to explain it in a way I think it happens here. Israel's in a position that's not a good position. And the temptation for Samuel is, well, you put yourself here. What, what am I going to, what, what can I do now to, 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 to help this nation? I mean, you guys, you're obviously dead set to, to go against God. What am I supposed to do? But Samuel doesn't do that. He says, I will not sin against God in ceasing to pray for you. I will continue to bring your, your name up before the Lord. I will continue to lift you up before God as a priest to, to, to bring the names of, of, of Israel before God. He said, I, I'm not going to sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you, but here's the other part of that. I will teach you the good and the right way. You can renew your life by a personal commitment to prayer and sound doctrine. Sin, sin, one way to explain sin, I guess, is, is this. Sin is to stop, stop seeking the Lord. You just, you just stop seeking the Lord. Maybe you think it's hopeless. I don't know. Maybe you just, you just got found pleasure in something else and you just, you know, got turned off by God and you're not interested anymore or because you're so interested in other things. You got so busy or, or whatever it is. 
And you just sort of meander off like the, the wayward sheep. You just meander off. And you walk off. Renew your life by personal commitment to prayer and sound doctrine. <laughs> I, was, I was talking to, I don't know, somebody a couple weeks ago. Nobody in here, so don't worry. You're not this illustration. <laughs> but they're in a position, and, and I don't know what goes through our minds to think that if I get away from God, that's, gonna, that's going to help my situation. If I stop going to church, if I stop hanging around believers, if I stop, uh, I don't know, if I just go do my own thing, whatever your own thing is, that's going to somehow improve my situation. But we think that stuff all the time. It's like, when did we think that the solution was get farther away from God and somehow that was the solution to the problem? The problem wasn't that you were too close to God to begin with. So the solution isn't running away from God. If anything's involved in solution, it's getting close to the Lord. Where, but where, where do we get in our minds that, that quitting on God is the solution? That's another thing. It's like, well, then I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna not go to church anymore, or whatever, whatever the threat is. Well, I'm just gonna not do that anymore. So, and that's a solution to your problem, and that's supposed to help the situation. You know, when ten years or twenty years down the road, you're you're reaping all the all the fruit of this decision that you made way back here, and you're coming back to, oh, help me, help me, help me. I'm in such a mess now. When did we think leaving the things of God was a solution to anything? So here's what Samuel says. The opposite of that is true. He says, as for me, I'm not, I'm not going to, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. That's, that's doctrine. That's good doctrine. It, it is, he, Samuel just shares his own resolve with the people. He says, look, I'm going to do it this way. I'm not going to abandon my responsibility because, because we've made these bad decisions now. I'm not going to abandon what my job is because we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a bigger mess than when we started this thing. I'm not going to abandon. The, the, the solution is not to abandon the course. You stay the course. So Samuel shares his own resolve to prayer and sound doctrine. He says, I will teach you the good and the right way. I'm going, to, I'm going to continue teaching you the good and the right way, whether you listen or not, whether, whether it's helpful or, or you think it's helpful. Samuel says, I'm going to continue to give you what's good and right. And then this, just a couple more real quick. You can renew your life by considering what great things Jesus Christ has done for you. Here's how it's said in verse 24. Samuel says, only fear the Lord, serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. If, if, if nothing else makes sense, that ought to make sense. If you've got a relationship with the Lord, consider how great things and what great things he's done for you. You know what Jesus Christ has done for you? Whether, whether you've received Jesus Christ, whether you trust him or not, Jesus Christ has laid down his life for your sins. And then Jesus Christ has taken up his own life and resurrected and now sits at the right hand of God Almighty in heaven. And he is a mediator for every man, woman, and child. He is the, he is the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He lived a holy life. He died on a cross, not because he was a sinner. He died on a cross for sinners. And then he was buried and then, and, and, and that, that, that alone, that dying on the, that alone is a mouthful. I mean, I can just, you know, I can just, it's, it's so easy to just say it up here. He died on a cross, but what, what went into all that? That's a mess. That's a complete mess. And to think that Jesus Christ endured when he could have called 12 legions of angels down to destroy every single Roman soldier that took a swing at him. And he didn't. In fact, he didn't even say anything. 
He didn't defend himself because he had a purpose that was to die in place of your sin. Not to die for sinners, but to die in place of your sin so that he would be an acceptable sacrifice, so that God the Father would look at him and accept you on the basis of him. And then buried and then rose again the third day and then offers eternal life to whosoever will. So when you think and consider, this is is just part of, but the biggest part of what Jesus Christ has done. And I know that's not all what Samuel's talking about specifically here, but it relates. Samuel had just relayed the history to Israel and said, here's what God did for you here. 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 And your problem right now in thinking you need a king is you haven't considered what God's already done for you. So you have this solution to a problem that's not a solution to any problem. God was there the whole time in your history. You just didn't consider it. And you're not considering it now. You know what happens in our our individual lives? We get these solutions to these problems that aren't solutions to problems that may or may not be problems. And our solutions come from a place of a lack of consideration for what God's already done. Well, we got to do it this way. we got to do it this way. I need to do this. I need to hurry up and do this. And we fret ourselves and worry and fret and worry and fret. And Samuel says, look, you, you want to get renewed here? This, this opportunity in Gilgal is an opportunity to renew the kingdom. You want to get renewed? Here's how you get renewed. Consider what great things God's already done for you. Go back in history and think about it. Consider what great things he's done for you. I, I, I would think, well, in my life, I'll just I'll use another personal testimony. When I consider what Jesus Christ has done for me, that, that helps correct some attitudes. That helps correct some thoughts. When I consider what great things the Lord has done for me, that helps that helps my relationship with other people. That, help, that helps how I consider the ministry. That helps how I consider pastoring people. That helps with my being a dad and being a husband. And hopefully it helps being a husband. Mary Beth's not here to tell you, but that's, you know, I'll just, I'll just say it. um, it's helped. <laughs> But when I consider what Jesus Christ has done for me, you know what it does? It resets my thoughts and it resets my attitude and it makes me consider, you know what? Maybe, you know, Jesus Christ did this and he handled this situation this way. (laughs) Maybe I can just sort of take my hands off or put my hands on whatever the case may be and, and, and adjust and correct My own attitude or my own thoughts or my own behaviors. Renew your life by considering what great things Jesus Christ has done for you. Maybe it's the way you treat a church member. Maybe it's a relationship. Almost everything, it boils down to relationships. People get mad, they get mad because of relationships. They get something broke down. The expectation wasn't met here. And this expectation wasn't met. And so now we're mad. And then I had that, this thought that you were going to do this, but you didn't do this. And so now I'm frustrated with you. Maybe you need a reset. Maybe it's time to consider what Jesus Christ has done for you. Knowing you're a sinner. Knowing I'm a sinner. And he still treated us the way he's treated us. And he's still done the things for us that he's done for us. And and I'm saying that, and I'm assuming the folks, I shouldn't assume this, but I'm saying this to saved folks. But if you're listening and you're not saved, maybe that's why this isn't registering. Maybe it's, I don't know what Jesus Christ has done for me. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what he's done for you. Number one, he's died in your place for your sins. He rose again and he offers you freely righteousness, the righteousness of God. He offers you free justification from your sins. Because there is, there is coming a day when you will stand before a holy God and give an account of your sins. 
And it's not a time where you put up a defense. It's, ju- it's just a sentencing time. Your crimes are already listed. Those things are already listed. This isn't where you have your day in court and there's an attorney and God's a judge and you get to state your case. You're stating your case with your life now. And the sentencing time comes, the Bible says, there's appointment unto men wants to die and after this, the judgment. That comes at the sentencing time. And as, as Craig prayed earlier, a soul that is unrighteous, that still has sin on it, that soul has no place with God. And unfortunately, God did create a place for lost souls that still have sin, and that place is called hell. And he didn't, he didn't create it for mankind. The Bible says he creates for the devil and his angels and all that stuff, but man has chosen in his own nature, in his own behavior, in his own will, man's chosen to rebel against God. And if man doesn't get that thing right, and when I say get that thing right, I mean beg and, and plead for the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Because that's where the righteousness of God is. It's in Jesus Christ. You and I are in the position of being sinners who need justification. We don't create justification. We need it from God. Renew your life by considering what great things Jesus Christ has done for you. And then lastly is this. Samuel says, here's here's some reasons. Here's some ways we can renew the kingdom. This is what we're going to do to renew the kingdom. And if none of those things, none of those things make sense or you don't want to do these things, let me give you just a fair warning. And this is what Samuel says, verse 25. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. <laughs> wow. It's like, it's like God says, I don't need your king. You don't need your king. I don't want to put a king here, but you demanded me put a king here. The instruction is still the same. If you'll follow me, you'll get the blessings of following me. Talking to Israel. I I understand it's a little bit different individuals now and all that kind of stuff, but the nation. But he says, the, the Lord says, but if you are resolved, to do wickedly, then I will consume you along with your king. It's like God just, I don't need your king. You demanded a king. I gave you a king. I don't need your king. But if you and your king choose to do wickedly, I will consume you and the king I've set up. You understand? I mean, the... the, And you'll find out, how how does this relate to you and I? Well, all those little things we set up in our lives as authorities, all those little things that we we set up contrary to the word of God, like when God says something very specific, trust Jesus Christ, follow Jesus Christ, go to church, be faithful, serve God. I mean, these are just general things. When he says these, these things and gives instruction and we, we have this, this other thing, this idol, this alternate opinion. We say, well, well, I can't do it because of this. Then the Lord says, whatever this other king is, whoever you set up, you choose to do wickedly, I will consume you and the king you set up. I mean, it's, it, it is literally, literally, the Lord is trying to get Israel to renew the kingdom here. He's trying to get them to reset. Look, you, you are in a bad spot. Now it's time to rethink what we've done here. Now it's time to get some things right. And so I'll, I'll just put it out there for, for all of us. This is an opportunity. This sermon that Samuel preaches is a sermon of renewal. And it ends on a warning. He just says, if you won't do this, if, if, if you don't want to consider what great things God's done for you, if you don't want to stay the course, if you don't want to 
put your hands to and defend what God is working on and defend what God is defending. If you don't want to take a personal commitment towards prayer and, and, and sound doctrine, if you're opposed to all of that, just know, just know that God will flush away you and the king you've set up. And that's just what he'll do. And he says it to Israel as a warning and all all of this other stuff. There's positive stuff in here. The last thing is a warning. How does that apply to you and I? I I guess since we're preaching on it this morning, it's an opportunity for renewal. You know what this morning is? Opportunity for renewal. I, I I would bet... And I'll try not to spend much time on this. We'll we'll wrap it up here. 2020 has probably been a reset for a lot of people. There are probably some things that you have, you didn't find important before, and now you find important. Because the Lord has just stripped away some things, and uh, he's allowed Things to happen the way they have. We've all been put in this position. But I imagine in most of our lives and some of your lives, there's some things that are muddied up. But there's also been some things in 2020 that have been clarified now. There's also been some things that have been sort of pruned away. And you look at your life and you say, you know what, that was a vain thing. And I wasted my time on that. And now I kind of see what's really important. Now I kind of see that thing I, I spent all this time and money and, and energy on. It really wasn't going to amount to anything. And now, now it can't amount to anything because it's just been stripped away. You know what it is? It's a time for renewal. It's not a time to quit. It's not a time to, time to uh, uh, tuck your tail and run, so to speak. It's a time to do exactly what Samuel says. Stay the course. Defend what God defends. Renew your life with personal commitment to prayer and sound doctrine. Consider what great things God hath done. And unfortunately, if you don't want to do any of those things, the Lord said to Israel, I'll just consume you and your king. But that's the only negative side of all that. The other things are opportunities. Let's do this. I I don't want to keep repeating this. You get the idea. It's an opportunity for renewal. Renewal with relationships. Maybe there's something you need to get right with somebody. Maybe there's something you need need to to deal with with the Lord. Maybe it's just between you and the Lord. Maybe it's a decision you need to to rethink. I don't don't know. There's, There's enough folks in here. There's all kinds of individual needs here. But as Sam comes and plays a little bit on the piano, we'll have a little time of invitation. And think about this renewal. Renewing relationships. Renewing your relationship with the Lord. Renewing your service. Renewing your, your prayer life. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. Go ahead, Sam.
All right. Well, God bless you guys for being here. I pray that's helpful. It is. A, it is a real opportunity for renewal. If there's if there's some things you need to get right, I encourage you get them right between you and the Lord. Get them right between each other. Get them right wherever you need to get them right. But uh, as Samuel gave Israel an opportunity to renew the kingdom, it's an opportunity, a real opportunity. And uh, God bless you guys for being here again. And uh, have a good afternoon. Nice weather out there and all that. I, I'm, I'm really excited about the nursing home. I'm excited about all the, the public ministry. I'm excited about the opportunities that are continuing to, to show up. Um, and uh, stay faithful. You just stay faithful with it. And, and the Lord will, he's working. <laughs> you just take up, take up his work and he'll, he'll support the work. So, uh, Alan, how about you dismiss us in prayer this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this picture of Friday.